he's very, very shy. <laughs> <laughs> we have a real problem with this guy. Uh, last week he called and canceled. He gave us some kind of a snow jump. <laughs> well, he can't get away from it now. Everything about this guy is good. He was a star pilot. He knew everything. Flew everything with wings. You're going to talk about early aviation, how they navigated from bonfire to bonfire. And he was there. <laughs> okay, I gotta do it. I'm sorry. Lou Mark, would you please come up here? <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Bob. Thank you. I got the alarm clock set. What, what did you give him? Ten minutes? Yeah, I got a lot of stuff going on right now. Yeah. Uh, you don't have what you feel like. Comes over.
the Army Air Corps demonstrated that pilots could fly a reliable night route by following rotating beacons across the state of Ohio. Based on this, I'm sure I'll find out here on page two. Based on this, the, air, the, air, the U.S. began erecting every 10 miles on top of 51 foot towers and visible 40 miles flashing red beacons. They were identified by Morse code. <laughs> you remember, Chuck? Identified by Morse code, flashing, they were flashing, and green is located near an airport and depicted on the earlier navigation charts. The beacons were bright enough to aid in both day and night operation. By 1934, the government operated 1,500 beacons covering nearly 18,000 miles. I flew lighted airways going through pilot training in 1949. I'm not playing with myself, I'm looking for something. <laughs> Please, guys. Be polite. I won't, come, I won't be here next week. <laughs> That's a promise. I grew up in an example of the lighted airways. This here, you can see this, goes, this is a sample air, lighted airway. And again, there are 18,000 miles of them throughout the United States. This depicts from Minneapolis to Eau Claire. And if you remember your Morse code, Minneapolis, MSP, what's the Morse code for that? You remember that, Chuck? I, I still remember the Morse code. Minneapolis is da da, did da did da 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 da. So that's Minneapolis. The first beacon would be 10 miles out. It would be identified by Morse code by a dip, da 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 number. You have, and then the one green phenomenon for an airport, and then they can have Eau Claire with the dit, dit, da, dit, da, da. This is what the pilots would use for flying airways. Our, this is another test question. Our, the lighter airway beacons do not provide the round the clock air mail service the post office desired. What was the reason? Dick? Two dicks. What was the reason that the lighted airways did not provide the service that the post office wanted? Glenn? What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> the reason being is you had to be SEE. -E. You had to see the beacons. So even though there were lighted airway beacons and it was a great improvement, but they had no radio contact to advise the depending weather, and the pilots had to be able to see the ground. So it limited their operation, even though it was a great improvement. In 19, so they needed something better. In 1929, two events occurred that had the potential of providing the reliability that the post office department saw. One, Jimmy Doolittle, I like to get those dollars back. <laughs> they're real, they're real one dollar bills. Anyway, number one, Jimmy Doolittle, while under an instrument hood in the back seat of a Curtis biplane, proved that it was possible to make a takeoff, fly a route, and land by use of cockpit instruments only. That was in 1929. The second instant that provided better service was Frank Adcock. He's an English engineer, perfected his low frequency radio range concept that would provide guidance along Pacific routes without reference to the ground. Now they can finally find clouds. With this, the U.S. built about 90 low frequency ranges, 200 miles apart, and covered about 15,000 miles in the United States. Here's a typical low frequency air range that I drafted to show you who's Frank Edcock. What happened to my laser? 
work. Anyway, Frank Hickok, there was four ranges that, that would transmit in a directional mode. So transmitting out to the west, they'd be give a constant A, dip dot. To the east, it'd be a constant A, dip dot. And transmit to the north would be a da dip n. And to the south, a da, a da dip n. When these signals meshed, it produced a steady sound, a CW tone. <laughs> and Frank Adcock demonstrated that by arranging these towers, he could put them in any direction, true north direction he wanted for the beacons, for the sound of tone. Every 30 seconds, there'd be the, the signals would stop and they'd, they'd transmit the identification of the station. What I had here was Minneapolis, so it'd be da da, did it, did did it dot hit so you, you could identify the station. However, even with this added aid to navigation, there were problems. Sunspots, night effect, skip signals, and mountain strain effect to station reliability. To provide more accurate navigation, it was the, kind of the early VOR. Uh, back up a little. Here's a typical airways a demonstration of the low frequency airways. By arranging the beacons to transmit a steady, set a steady signal to stay on the airway, stay in the beam. These were running operation up into Bobbinville, up into about the late 50s, early 60s. They had low frequency ranges. But like I mentioned, they were still affected by sunspots, terrains, iron deposits in the ground and they're not totally reliable. So, what they came out next was the visual oral range insulation. This is the instrument we had in the cockpit. There were still legs that you had to fly, but you didn't have to listen to them. Once you identified the station, you by this instrument, if, you, if the vertical needle moved off the yellow, you're to the right of the range leg. If it moved the blue, you're to the left. So you just had to keep the needle centered. The horizontal needle was the early ILS. So this was a great improvement. There's a couple of sidebar notes here I mentioned. Here's a typical VAR range. It was very similar to the low frequency range, and you can look at the chart and get the, depth, the, the headings and their location. But I, I drew it, I painted in a couple here, yellow and blue, to show on course and off course. And they were all over the United States, this is part of the East Coast. So they were really, a, that was really an improvement. Then we went to VORs, which they're still used today. <coughs> Here's a couple of sidebar notes I listed. Lighted airway beacons. This is kind of a surprise when they're government employees. They were, they were finally decommissioned in 1973, imagine that about 20 years after they were no longer used. I think if these same people had been in charge of Fort Motor Company, would still be producing Model Ts. <laughs> the first two radio contact between an aircraft and the ground was made in 1928. That was the year I was born, but I'm sure it wasn't, it was just a coincidence. And the first radio control airport was established in Cleveland in 1930. Low frequency ADCOT ranges and the VIAR ranges were phased out in 1970 when they were replacing VHL beacons, which we use today. In the early days, in the early airmail days, there were no air, female airmail pilots. I think this is my interpretation. I think they figured that there were safer ways to demonstrate their independence, like wearing long pants, smoking in public buying a drink in a speakeasy and voting for a Democratic president. <laughs> I want to go back up to, this is kind of interesting, and I hope you pay attention because I'm sure you want to cover it with your wife when you get home today. <laughs> Who's chuckling? <laughs> Who isn't? <laughs> Anyway, when I was going through pilot training in 1949 in the instrument phase, 
I would report to my instructor, Captain Ray Vetter, early on. He was an older guy, about 27, 28. I was 20 years old. He flew a full 30 some tours in B 24 in Europe. And I would report to the airplane. And Ray Vetter said, Today, Mr. Martin, we're going to do a range orientation. So I'd get in the back seat of this T 6. Cost extra for that seat. <laughs> No charge today. <laughs> no charge. Anyway, Ray Vetter would say, today, Mr. Mark, we're going to do a range orientation. So I'd get in the back seat of the T-6, raise the hood so I could see outside. He'd taxi off the runway, I'd line up this DG, and I'd make a takeoff, and he'd give me a heading, and he'd say, climb to 5,000 feet. I was going to only climb under that hood. And after about 15 minutes, he'd turn on a range station. He said, I have a range station. I want you to identify it and fly over the cone of silence. So I put the switch up, and this is what I want you to I wish my laser worked, but it doesn't. Try it again. No, I'll have to use the old finger. But he'd, I'd flip the switch up, and maybe I'd receive steady M. Da dip. Da dip. Bob knows this, I'm sure. Oh, thanks. That's, is that mine? No, not now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. So I throw the, throw the switch up and I get a steady end. Da dip. Da dip. So I knew I was receiving the end signal of an ad hoc range. I didn't know the identification yet. So I'd wait about 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds, it transferred. <coughs> I'm using Minneapolis here, MSP. Da da, did it, did it, did it, da did. So now I know I'm receiving the Minneapolis Adcock Raiders. And I'm in an end quadrant in the south or the north. How do I determine? I'm just all under the hood. I'm still flying. How do I determine which range, like this section I'm in? Pardon me? You're, you want to? You finished off the lecture. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but, but Chuck is right. So I pick up an arbitrary heading, say, of north, and I turn the volume down. Now I'm flying on the heading of north, either this squadron or this squadron. And I turn the volume to way down so I can just barely hear it with my 20 year old ears. And if I'm flying north, the volume is going to decrease quite rapidly. If I'm in the south range, it's going to increase. So I'm using an example the volume increasing. Now I know I'm in this end quadrant here because the volume is increasing. If I keep flying north, I'm going to cross the range lane. I don't know which one yet. If I cross this range lane because I get a steady tone, then I start receiving an A. I hope you're paying attention because your wife will be interested. <laughs> <laughs> so I get a steady A. Now, once I get a steady A, do I cross this range line or this range line? After I get an A, I make a 90 degree turn. If I cross this range line, I'm going to fly right back into a range line. Now I know where I am. The example I'm using, I cross this range line, I make a 90 degree turn, and I get a deeper A. I know I've crossed this range line, I make a 180 degree turn, pick up ahead in the service wave, fly over the station. By what we call a cone of silence. And I shake the stick to wake up the instructor. <laughs> and I can hear him saying, By God, Mr. Martin, we might make a pilot out of you after all. <laughs> <laughs> I want to change directions here just a little bit. We're still doing well on time. Bob's not going to quite as safe. That's okay. No easy way. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> It's all navigation, Bob. <laughs> How much time does he have left, Parker? <laughs> 12 minutes. Anyway, I'm going to change directions a little bit here. I'm sure most of you have lost friends in World War II. I lost colleagues in the Vietnamese War, where we killed 38,000, and the Korean War, where we killed 33,000. Now we have lost over 4,000 in Iraq and over 1,100 in Afghanistan. My son, who many of you met, just the other day told me that he lost two friends in Afghanistan. 
I'm so concerned, that's my personal opinion, as far as I'm concerned, Afghanistan has got to get the hell out of there right now. Let them kill each other holding up a copy of the Quran yelling, Allah Akbar. But before closing today, see if this works out. I'm going to play a song that you will all recognize. I think it, it really symbolizes, quintessential symbolizes the futility of war. But it was made popular in 1960. I think you all recognize it. See if this works. <coughs>
was at the airport, there was a building over there with aerial uh, things for you guys to fly by. They, uh, I have one minute yet to go for 30, so I want to share one other thing with you. I mentioned that these low freak ranges had a lot of interference, especially in thunderstorms and rain. I remember in the spring of 1953, I was on a flight from Palo Alto Springs to Greenville, South Carolina. I was flying through a steady air mass thunderstorm area. I was hit by lightning twice, steady rain. I could not stay on a range light because of the interference. It's just solid static. I was trying to stay at 9,000 feet. I'd go to 8,000 feet, up to 11,000 feet from turbulence. I reported to Kansas City that my position was unreliable. While I was doing that, a four-engine aircraft went right over the top of me. It was that night. I could see four exhaust. I reported to Kansas City that the aircraft went right over the top of me. He said it was bombing the American Airlines DC-4. That reported he was unable to, he was, his position was unknown. So that was trying to fly a low freak range. The BARs on their VHF frequency was a great improvement as we have today. What were you flying? C-82. Boxcars. Hey, Lou. Yeah. I was also have a problem with this, Lou. Uh, you drink martinis? Yeah, anyway, my, my brother-in-law has got Parkinson's, and I asked him one time, have I got Parkinson's? And he says, no, that's old age. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be a little serious, because we're all getting up in years. The neurosurgeon, like I said, I had a CAT scan, head and brain. And he said it's arthritis. It's, it's just a spasm of arthritis. And I was very fortunate that to hear him say that it wasn't Parkinson's. And he definitely said no, it wasn't Parkinson's. It was just arthritis. And of course, I, I still say it's from shaking martinis. That's the cause of arthritis. <laughs> All right, thank you. Someday, Lou maybe Martin. I can, yeah. Lou Martin, no one does it better. Let's hear it. <laughs>